Tonight's reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 20 to 29. It's Hebrews 11, 20 to 29. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Thank you, Ian. If you keep your Bibles open there, that will be a help to us tonight. And I... I'm going to encourage you to use your Bibles in turning to a number of references in the Old Testament. So if you are feeling weary at all, then you should breathe a silent prayer for help, because uh, we haven't even reached the peak time of the day yet, I believe. And I wasn't sure whether it said that the peak time goes on until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, or it begins again at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. But I do know that I will not be there either tonight. and certainly not at 10 tomorrow morning. I'm delighted to be back here. It is a great privilege to come, a, a wonderful thing, and it's uh, an immense opportunity, and it's a privilege to be here. I'm appreciative of the welcome and the greetings uh, expressed, and I am delighted also with a title that has been chosen. I find it very, very difficult to choose titles for things. It takes me ages, and when I discover that the two weeks were to be um, gathered together under the heading of dangerous faith. I felt it extremely important and helpful, and I would like to borrow from that title tonight and use that as the title for the study in which we now share. What I would like to do with us this evening, as we come to the end of the day, is to look together at the verses that have just been read and to identify from them six practical implications of what it means to live out dangerous faith. Six practical implications of living out dangerous faith. Before I do that, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that the question of faith is a matter of great confusion for many, many people who are unchurched, who are on the fringes of things that we may sing about and profess to know a lot about. Men and women, by and large, in secular society, are confused about the nature of faith. And for a number of them, faith is simply uh, a kind of irrational belief in things which are highly improbable. Like the wee boy who went home from Sunday school and told his mom that they had been studying the story of Moses leaving Egypt. How did that happen, asked his mom. Well, he said, there were aliens that came down. They had these spaceship and they sucked the people of of Israel up into the spaceships. The spaceships were invisible, and they were able to go through the air, and then finally they landed across the other side of the Red Sea. Come, come, his mother said, that's surely not what you were told. No, said the wee boy, but if I told you it the way I was told, you would never, ever believe it. (laughs) And while we may come in here well-versed tonight and convinced of certain things, our neighbors and our friends, our work colleagues to whom we return in these coming days do not necessarily share the kind of convictions that are ours. For them, faith, if it is anything, is an irrational belief in something that is highly improbable. Others regard faith, especially a Christian expression of faith, as simply an intellectual cop-out. 
For others, faith is nothing more than a psychological crutch. It is vitally imperative, therefore, that as those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, that we are able to articulate what we believe. Not only are we able to declare it verbally, but that we are living it out graphically and obviously in our daily routine. And so, tonight, let us lay it down as foundational, lest there be any who are wondering, or lest we ourselves are a little confused. When the New Testament, when the Bible in totality actually speaks concerning faith, faith is described, if you like, in two parts. Faith is, first of all, a decisive act. The grace of God is at work in our world and in our lives, bringing us to a point where we cease to rely upon ourselves as it comes to meriting salvation, and with a firm conviction as to the truth of God's promises of mercy in Jesus Christ, we depend sincerely upon them. The hymn writer puts it, Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply. There came a day in his life where he recognized that he could neither earn his way to heaven, nor could he somehow or another finagle his way to heaven, but he could go only one way, and that was on the strength of the work of Jesus. The Bible is unmistakably clear when it comes to these things. We do not believe the same as other religions. The Jews believe that God was monotheistic. We believe that God became incarnate in Jesus. We can't both be right. The Hindus believe that there have been many expressions of, G of God. We believe that He has been incarnate only once. We cannot both be right. And so it goes on. Therefore, there is an exclusivity about faith that we cannot back away from. And indeed, in the kind of world in which we live, it is important for us to be able to express it. So, if we're here tonight, perhaps wondering about these things, let us understand that when we speak about faith, at the heart of the matter is an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, which shows to us the end of ourselves, our need of Him as a Savior, and which elicits from us a response which relies on nothing that we have, nothing that we've done, nothing that we claim for ourselves, and trusts wholly and exclusively upon Him. The kind of faith succinctly expressed in the six words in Philippians, to me, to live, is Christ. And for those of you who've been around a number of years, you may well recall George B. Duncan's great sermon on to me, to live, is Christ. I'm tempted to preach it because it's probably better than the one I have here myself, but I'll give you the outline just as I'm passing. To me, it is something personal. In my acceptance of Christ, in my allegiance to Christ. To live, it is something practical. Every matter may be shared with Him. Every moment may be spent with Him. Is Christ, it is something possible. It is available to all. It is attainable by all. So when we speak faith, we're speaking first of a decisive act and then of a sustained attitude. The Bible makes it perfectly clear that faith is in many, many respects like a muscle. It needs to be exercised in order that it might prove strong and effective. If you don't exercise your muscles, they atrophy. And so we exercise, and so we exercise the muscle of faith. And faith is not something that is simply to be declared, but it is something that is to be displayed. And here in Hebrews chapter 11, which is a well-known chapter on the subject of faith, we find that it falls between two stirring exhortations. At the end of chapter 10, the writer has encouraged the readers not to throw away their confidence, but instead to really persevere. At the beginning of chapter 12, he says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race. Let us keep on persevering. And in the intervening section, which is Hebrews 11, he provides this great gallery, this great picture gallery of those who have lived their lives in such a way so as to encourage us to follow hard after them. 
And from these many verses, there are some 40 of them, I've chosen to look just at a few, and admittedly, they're not the most uh, tackled verses. So hopefully, they will yield that which is beneficial to us now at the end of the day. So here are these six things. Number one, dangerous faith will always display concern for the spiritual well-being of our children. Now, here we are at verse 20. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. What about it? Is there much in that? Yes, there is a wealth contained in that. Because Isaac, like his father Abraham, trusted in God. And now we're told that as he draws to the end of his life, his concern is that his children will receive the blessing of God upon their lives. In writing here, the writer doesn't deal with the deception by which Jacob was misled by his mom, by which he was unkind to his dad, in which he was jealous of his brother. But when you read Genesis 27, and that's where you'll find it, and you compare it with what Paul says in Romans chapter 9, we discover that in all of these intriguing events involving these characters and their father, they're in Scripture to remind us of God's infinite wisdom, His overruling sovereignty, and His amazing mercy. And so here we have a man, now grown, now ancient of days, as it were, and his all-consuming concern at the end of it all is for the spiritual well-being of his children. And if you turn, and you can do some homework on this, if you turn to Genesis chapter 28 and to the blessing that he pronounces upon Jacob, you will notice that this blessing has to have come as a result of faith. This is what we read. Genesis 28, verse 3, "'May God Almighty bless you,' he says, "'and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham, so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham." The blessing Isaac bestows upon his boys could only be by faith, because he himself was an alien. He owned no land. How then could he talk about the nations who would serve and honor his descendants? He could only do it by faith. It was faith which had marked his life, and it was faith which had marked his pilgrimage with his family. And now at the end of it all, his concern is for the blessing to be upon his children. Don't tell me tonight that you live the life of dangerous faith, nor should I be as bold as to suggest to you that I do. Without within my life there is to be found, and in yours also, believer, an all-consuming, passionate desire for the spiritual well-being of my children. The spiritual well-being of my children. Let me speak for a moment to fathers here. My concern in these little uh, statements is not so much to delve into the historical background. We can do that as homework. But to ask concerning the practical implications all these centuries later. And here's the question, dads. With what are we blessing our children? With what are we blessing our children? If we're decent enough dads, then we're seeking to provide for them in physical terms. We provide for them materially. We make sure there is food to eat. Our moms help with that, or our wives do. We make provision educationally for them, and sometimes at great cost, because we don't want them to be sick, and we don't want them to be crazy, and we don't want them to be out in the street. That's just part of parenting. There are things that we make them do, and there are events that we take them to. And we make them do these things, and we take them to these things because we believe they matter. And so we take them to cello lessons, and we take them to athletic events, and we take them to the Natural History Museum, and we take them on little holidays, and we take them down and show them castles and all sorts of things in order that they might have a well-orbed experience of life. It's all part of being a dad. But what of our children's spiritual heritage. Dangerous faith in a father brings with it a consuming, passionate concern 
for the spiritual well-being of His children. Now, what will that involve? We'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6 for just a moment, and let's look at what we're told ought to be the case. The Shema, which is found there on the doors of many of our Jewish neighbors and friends. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. There's priority number one, to love God in this all-consuming fashion. Not first to love our activities for God or our service for God, but to love God. I think our children are bright enough to be able to discriminate between whether we love doing things or whether we really love the one for whom we do, whether we simply love sitting in services or whether we love Jesus, and whether this love has a kind of one day in seven factor or whether it really embraces all of our lives. Genuine blessing from a father to his children must come from a father's heart to the hearts of his children. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And these commandments that I give you today are to be not in your heads, but upon your hearts. Now, they're obviously in our heads because they come to us through our minds, but they are to be in the very center of our being. Why? So that you can impress them on your children. Does that sound a little like indoctrination? Yes. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. Indeed, he says, tie them round your forehead, and tie them round your wrists, and don't go anywhere without them, and make sure that your children know what your greatest longing for them is. Do your kids know what your greatest longing for them is, dads? Is it possible that they might have assumed that what you want for them is that you, they will fulfill your unfulfilled ambitions? That they're trying to live up to a standard that you or I have determined is the way they ought to go, and somewhere in the midst of it all, they're wondering what kind of blessing this could possibly be? I speak to many other young parents here today, I guess. This is family week. I'm assuming so. I speak to you from my own heart. I have a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, at least we do. So far, so good, but there are no guarantees for tomorrow. But I know this, that if as fathers we do not put in the hard work of molding our children according to the commandments of the Lord when they are like tender apple trees, easily redirected and moved, we will be unable to change them when their bark grows thick and they grow strong and their root structure is down and they've established themselves having branched out in all directions." Wonderful, wonderful picture in Nehemiah. It was alluded to, I think, earlier in the day, or perhaps it was last evening, where in Nehemiah chapter 8, the people ask for the book to be brought out. Bring out the book, they say. How oh, that would be a wonderful word for many a pastor in this generation if there were people wanting him to bring out the book. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And he read it aloud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. Who is that? Dogs? Cats? No. Children. Children. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Do your children listen attentively to the word as it is proclaimed? They never will if you don't. Will they love it? Not if you don't. Will they expect it as a blessing from our hands? Highly unlikely. We may take our children and introduce them to structures and to formulae but it is only by grace through a loving heart that we may introduce them to the reality of the love of Jesus. What is dangerous faith? It's not a three-and-a-half-inch floppy disk, you see, somewhere in the midst of 15 or 10 of them. Dangerous faith 
is at the heart of who we are and all we are. And dangerous faith will reveal itself in a concern for the spiritual well-being of our children. Listen to these words of a father as he came towards the end of his opportunities as a parent. This is what he said, my family is all grown. The children are all gone. But if I had to do it all over again, this is what I would do. I would love my wife more in front of my children. I would laugh with my children more at our mistakes and our joys. I would listen more. I would be more honest about my weaknesses and stop pretending perfection. I would pray differently for them. I would do more things with my children. I would be more encouraging and bestow more praise. I would pay more attention to little things, deeds, and words of love and kindness. Finally, if I had to do it all over again, I would share God more intimately with my family. I would use every ordinary thing that happened in every ordinary day to point my children to God. Principle number one seen in the life of Isaac is simply this, that faith displays concern for the spiritual well-being of our children. Secondly, faith faces death with confidence. Faith faces death with confidence. Verse 21 and 22, in the life of Jacob and of Joseph. You need to turn back to Genesis 48 to see this. It's quite wonderful, and you should. If you rustle the pages, it lets me know you're still here. Genesis 48. We can't go through all of this, but it, it will, you'll do well to start at the beginning and read on. But if you look at verse 8 for just a moment, when Israel saw the sons of Joseph, that's his grandsons, he asked, who are these? And in verse 9, the reply came, these, uh, they are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. And then in verses 15 and 16, we have Jacob now blessing his grandchildren. It's a wonderful picture. Then he blessed Joseph, and he said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. There's some grandpas here tonight. Your prayers are vital. Praying down the blessing upon the boys and the girls that are your physical and potential spiritual heritage. And his concern for them is overwhelming in contrast to his concern of his own impending demise. In verse 21, look at the matter-of-fact nature of these words. Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. I'm about to die, he says. It's over, and now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. But not with fear or with terror. We're told back here in Hebrews that he worshiped leaning on his staff. You can read of that in Genesis 32, his staff being a symbol of the fact that he was a pilgrim, that he was heading for another destination. You can read of it in Genesis 49 and the part that it had to play as God unfolded his purpose to him. You've probably got some stuff around your house that speaks to the testimony of God's faithfulness, don't you? If we'd spoken to him, he would have said, this staff's important to me. I like to lean on it. I praise God when I lean on my walking stick, he says. Bless these boys. I'm about to die. Same thing when you look at Joseph. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. Joseph comes to the end of his days, and his biggest concern is that he would still be able to be taken, even if he was just a, a box of bones, would be taken into the promised land. What an incentive it must have been to the people then to realize this man really believes we're going. If he did not believe, there would be no reason in the world for him to say, now when I die, don't forget where you put me, because when you move, I'm coming. And they must have gone away out of his room and said, you know, he really thinks we are going somewhere. He really believes it's going to happen. 
He believes in God. I can tell it by the way he died. Loved ones, tonight, one of the most powerful applications of dangerous faith in the late 20th century is to be able to walk into death with boldness and with conviction. For the world has no answer to death. It cannot explain what it is about. It stumbles and it bumbles before it and rushes into silence. It paints pictures over it and hides from it. But when we read our Bibles, we don't find anything of the same. No, no, you see, because dangerous faith allows us to face death without fear. I ask you tonight, what good is a faith that has no victory over the ultimate event of life? What good is it? Someone comes and says, well, you know, I have faith. I, I have faith that there is someone other, that there is a God. My answer is, well, I'm delighted to hear this, but does your faith give you assurance of forgiveness? Does your faith grant to you peace? Does your faith allow you to face the final corridor of death with, with anticipation? When we were still students at London Bible College, one of our friends, a mutual friend, married a girl her name was Maria, lovely girl, wonderful singer. Within just a matter of months following their marriage, she was diagnosed with cancer. And in the course of those months, she wrote these words, God, I don't understand, but I love you and I trust you. Don't let me let you down in this battle. Help me, Lord, to be what you want me to be in this, to learn what you want me to learn in this not to waste this experience, but to show the reality of knowing you. On Thursday morning, before we left to come across, I conducted the funeral service of one of my friends, a member of my congregation, James Miller, the same age as me, 41. Seventeen months ago, on just a normal kind of day, he was diagnosed with a deep-seated cancer. And for the last 17 months, we've walked together into the valley of the shadow of death. And being with him just in the final hours before he passed away in the company of someone else, they asked him, James, what do you think you will see when your eyes close in death? And he thought for a while and he said, I don't know, but I do know this, that I will see Jesus. And that's enough for me. He planned his funeral service. He chose his hymns. And it was a great triumph of praise. In the Amish community there down in southern Ohio, his nieces and his nephews, along with the Amish community, shoveled in the earth with their own hands over his coffin, singing praise to Almighty God. You see, dangerous faith touches where we live our lives. And at the graveside, I reminded the people, you know, the really dangerous faith is faith which believes that we know better than the Word of God. The kind of faith which is faith in faith the kind of faith which has no objective basis, no secure foundation, the kind of silly talk, the kind of hope so's and maybes. That kind of faith leads nowhere. That's the faith of Sartre. That's the faith of Hemingway. He expressed it well. Life, he said, is a dirty trick, a short journey from nothingness to nothingness. Small wonder that he took a shotgun and blew his brains out. Dangerous faith in Christian terms not only cares for the spiritual well-being of my children, but faces death with confidence. There are six, but we have no time for another four. I am well able to turn sermons into series, and... Uh, It is not a good plan just at this point on a Sunday evening, looking out on some of your faces. I see some of you have already moved on to pastures new. And uh, 
at least metaphorically, I think of the wee boy sitting next to his dad, McDonald, who fell asleep, and the minister ran forward, and he said, Andrew, waking your dad, and Andrew shouted back, you waken him, you put him to sleep. But, um, <laughs> Incidentally, the same confidence in the face of death is expressed in the hymn that we sang, We Rest on Thee, Our Shield, and Our Defender. And those of you who remember missionary biographies will remember through Gates of Splendor and will remember that before Jim Elliot went up there into that cannibalistic tribe, the last thing that they did was to sing together, We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe. And suddenly, dangerous faith became a reality for Elliot. And within hours of the song, he was with the master that he served. Let me give you the final four points. You can make your own sermon out of them at your leisure. <laughs> In verse 23, we were going to notice the fact that faith dictates our actions. That's why Moses' mom and dad hid him, and their faith conquered their fears, and their faith controlled Moses' future. In verse 24 to 26, we were going to notice that faith determines our options. And we have that great expression of Moses when he's 40 years old, making this great refusal, making this wonderful choice, choosing social deprivation over social honor, material loss over material gain, physical desolation over physical satisfaction, choosing the eternal over the temporal, making choices which, from a human perspective, were absolutely ridiculous. And in verse 26, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. We were going to notice in verse 27 that it is faith that dispels our fear of man giving Moses the confidence to go before the Pharaoh. And in the final verses 28 and 29, faith leads to obedient activity, even although the activity is regarded as strange. Well, hey, what is strange and different about your life and mine that makes our neighbors and our friends believe that we are not just into some esoteric little religious club, but that we have actually been transformed by a power beyond ourselves. You see, the great challenge of these verses, to me at least, is this. If we're going to live out a faith that is in any sense dangerous, it has to take us beyond the level of our comfortable zones. That may change our geography, that may change our lifestyle, that may transform our relationships. That may mean that our life becomes rather disgraceful. But we don't like disgrace. I don't. Perhaps the words of C.T. Studd are a helpful conclusion. He faced these things. He faced dangerous faith. Remember what he said? If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice that I can ever make for him could ever be too great. The Word of God calls us, at whatever point we are on our spiritual pilgrimage, to the adventure of dangerous faith. Let us heed the call, and let us bow in a moment of silent prayer.